Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today I've got Jason Bond of Bond Trophy Outfitters on the line. Jason, how you doing? Doing great. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, um, here we are. We've got a great moisture year. want to get your thoughts. You live in Flagstaff, Arizona. Give the listeners kind of a breakdown. We're going to talk Arizona deer draw, um, applications and drawing for deer but uh, where do we stand right now, Jason? Yeah, so we're sitting real good. Obviously, uh, the last two monsoons have been great. Um, and then this winter was just unbelievable. I think we ranked in the top two in history recorded so far for uh, this winter. And anytime we're in the top 10, it's awesome. But this year just superseded that. Um, so yeah, I think I think we're sitting great, and then we just went through eight days of rain every day, almost like a monsoon season that rolled in on us every afternoon uh, up until about two days ago. So can't can't hurt with this uh, spring rain either. Um, I'm expecting it to be a phenomenal year and a great year for guys to draw tags. How much is a great winter moisture compared to a great May moisture? I'm up here in Colorado and those same storms that you guys are getting every afternoon for about a week was hitting us here in Colorado. And May is typically, for those listening, May is typically a really dry time of year. Um, How important or do you think the May showers are every bit as much important as having a great winter? I think it's, you know, equally important. I think we got to have a great winter for that feed to grow in the spring. But, you know, what we didn't see this year, we'll see it a little bit in June. But what we didn't see, um, usually right about now is when everything's brown, dry, at this elevation anyway. Like that Phoenix stuff will green up in late March, mid-March. All those poppies, everything starts popping up. And, you know, everything grows. But Flagstaff, you know, northern Arizona, um, Unit 10, 13B, tie about everything like that we see a lot of brown a lot of dry stuff um this year we're not seeing that like i'm looking outside right now into the forest service out my back door and it's just green i mean it looks like it's july you know after the monsoons are hitting so the vegetation's there um the green up is there um usually we don't even start looking for green up until the monsoons hit but it's basically a blanket of green right now yeah, so we've got the elk, you know, season. The draws are already complete with that, and and obviously, I think it's going to be a great elk year. Um, we are on the cusp here of the uh, June sixth deer applications and sheep applications for the state of Arizona. Um, deer plays a. You're a passionate deer hunter and and outfitter and guide for big deer. Um, how do you see this year shaking out with what, you know, if, if you had a crystal ball and could say, you know, 23 is going to be like, what year can you compare it to if you had to? I think it'll be like a 2019. I wish it would be like a 2010. Um, but I think it's going to be like a 2019. Um, the only reason we're not looking at a 2010 year, in my opinion, is, uh, you know, our age class is down a little bit, especially when we're talking 13B and 13A. Um, the kind of isn't as affected with the age class that, that 13A and 13B are. Um, so there'll be some giants coming out of the kind of no doubt about it, but, um, you know, there's going to be plenty of 200 inch bucks this year. You know, I think last year on your podcast and then some of my posts on my Instagram page, I was commenting about a 180 year type on the strip and which it was, um, there were some better bucks killed, but not many. Um, you know, this year, you know, a guy that draws a tag should expect to hunt 200 inch plus deer. Uh, that being said, those are going to be three and a half, four and a half year old deer with the occasional buck going over five. Um, you know, age class is still down, and I think in two or three years, we're going to see a huge turnaround in that. Um, well, I think you, know, you add the, the fact that, you know, the cameras have been taken away. Um, you come off a year of 21 where it was really dry, right? 21, yep. a really dry year. And Pretty much 20, 21, and 22. And, yeah, and then you throw in a good monsoon of 22 last summer, but late. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. It started late, but it was good once it came. Um, You know, those deer, those deer on the Kaibab or on the strip that were a couple years old that that were born in the drought years, now they've had two, you know, 
They've had a great 22 monsoon, late monsoon, but good feed sitting on the ground going into winter. Then they had a great 22, um, you know, tw 22 into 23 winter. And now we've got great 23 spring. I mean, in two or three years, we could, we could really um, reap the benefit of, of good rains. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, I was, you know, on, on that archery 13 B tag last year, I was up on, um, I, I think it's been at least 10 years or more since I've seen it rain like that on that hunt. I mean, every day, uh, there was tornadoes that came through, there was winds, there was lightning, there was, I mean, just flooding everywhere, inaccessible spots, people stuck. I mean, it was, it was just amazing. So that went into September. I mean, yeah, the, the monsoon was just phenomenal last year. So, yeah, I, I'm with you on the age class. I think if these deer, you know, with a with a great monsoon we had in 2021, great monsoon in 2022, both of them lacked winters. Um, and now this winter of 2023 or 2022, 2023, um, yeah, another two, three years, I mean, we're going to start seeing those mega giants back that are, you know, 250, 260, you know, possibly even stuff that's bigger. But we're going to start seeing those mega giants back, especially since they can't be targeted with the uh, with the cameras like like we have the last 15 years. Sure. Talk about, in your opinion, a little bit more the impact that you see moving forward as a you know as a positive for the guys listening. You know, obviously, if they draw a tag and they go with an outfitter and they can't use cameras, that they're lacking inventory. But just from from letting deer potentially slip through the cracks, how do you think that trail camera ban is going to play out? I think it's going to be awesome. I was all for it from the get go. I mean, I, nobody likes more regulation and stuff. That's for sure. But you know, it needed to take place, especially in a unit like 13A and 13B, um, no doubt about it. I mean, it's just detrimental with that deer herd up there. Um, they've got to go drink. Um, it's an arid climate. So, you know, last year on that archery hunt was the first year in, whew, I don't know, 17 years since there's been a camera out. Um, maybe 2004 or five, I guess, when camera, you know, digital cameras started, started hitting the market. Or, or rolled cameras and i think 2008 maybe was my first you know digital camera um and mass production of them 2010 where we started running 30 40 50 cameras and now obviously we have finished it several hundred cameras but on that archer deer hunt last year i saw one vehicle the entire time i was up there and it was just a ghost town i mean I think it was two weeks up there and one vehicle in two weeks. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And it reminded me what the strip used to be um, without people, you know, because previous to this camera ban, I mean, you, you, everybody was just bombing around, bombing around, checking cameras, checking cameras, checking cameras, and, and you know, identifying where their target buck might have moved or if he stayed in the same spot. So, and then everybody hunted the same bucks. Now not everybody knows of the same bucks. And you could go pick a sliver on the strip and just turn up the best luck you can find. So I think it really puts it puts the ball back in the DIY guys game, and and especially the guys that are going to book hunts need to book with the right guys that know the strip, spend a lot of time up there. Um, you know, it, it's just it's going to be an amazing hunt on the late hunts. It's going to be you know the rifle hunts. It's going to be an amazing hunt on the archery hunts. But you're just going to have to pound it because you don't know what's there. Talk a little bit about this year, the, the rifle season dates uh, in A go into Thanksgiving and are late, and, and obviously that puts B the, the first hunt, but it kicks that back about a week. Um, what are your thoughts on just timing alone of those hunts and how, that, how much more successful or, or not successful that will make people? Well, I, I mean, real simple, it can't get any better. Um, you know, you can't, you, it's like the perfect storm. You can't plan this year any better. Um, you know, you look at the moon phase for the 13B hunt, it's pretty much non existent. Moon starts up on that 13A hunt. You know, I generally say about the 8th is when I start seeing red activity on the strip, November 8th, sometimes a little bit before that, but, you know, it'll really get going by the 12th to the 15th. Um, so both hunts are going to be phenomenal. The 13A hunt is going to be ripping on the red. 
Um, you might end up with bucks with broken points and stuff like that just because it's a 17th and it's it's actually pretty dang late. Um, but that's just something we all contend with, whether it be elk hunting or deer hunting. I mean, who knows what gets broke up and when it gets broke up. And, you know, maybe they bust it off on a tree, maybe they bust it off on another buck. But, uh, you know, that 13B hunt, I, I love the date of the 10th. Um, and it goes through the 19th. The hunt will only get better as it goes on. Uh, and, you know, the big bucks are going to be with those or real close to them on the 10th. Um, and, and by the end of the hunt, they'll have the does. And the 13A hunt's going to start with full capacity and full blown rep. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Kayabab. Um, you have quite a bit of experience on 12A West and East and then 12B. Um, talk about some of the recent fires, the impact those fires have had, and just how those deer are moving on and off the plateau and and your thoughts on those seasons coming up this year. Yeah, so the biggest change we've seen in the last you know, three years, I guess, since the Mangum fire, I think that was three years ago, maybe two years, yeah, three years ago. Um, but the Mangum fire came through, started at Mangum camp, and then came kind of northeast out of there and burned across the top of the plateau and then dropped into the winter range, burned into 12B across the across Highway 89 there. Um, also in 12B, what's changed over the last several years is they've expanded their, their grinding of the junipers and, and basically making some mosaic patterns out in 12B with uh, getting rid of a lot of juniper country. So it's it's opened up a lot of stuff. It kind of looks like a golf course. It's It's kind of mosaic pattern with big juniper patches in the middle and then and then juniper patches and then bigger bigger openings. Um, so there's a lot of deer that, you know, 12A East on that note hasn't been affected that much. You know, 12A East hasn't really had a fire, hasn't changed anything since the warm fire. So the 12A East hunt is, is pretty much status quo. Um, when we go to the 12A West early hunt, you know, the Mangum fire opened up a bunch more glassable country. There's some good access stuff. Um, there's road access through through some of the fire, but some of it's wilderness type area where you're gonna have to walk into some of the canyons. Um, but it's right on the verge of dropping into that lower elevation. So on that early hunt, when they start that migration, you know whether they started at the first day or they start moving, you know throughout the hunt itself, they're gonna be moving through that burn. And there's plenty of feed and vegetation in it now that those deer hold up in there, and they're they're super huntable. So it's opened up a lot more country. You have the warm fire that everybody's been pounding, and I stayed away from personally um, just because of the amount of people in it. But now we got these two giant fires that happen and two two huntable areas within the fire that, that have really opened up a lot of space. Um, it's going to spread people out. So you're going to be able to hunt a lot of fire, but you can also hunt whatever's not burnt too, obviously. Um, that 12B country... You know, with the later dates on the early hunt this year, I expect that to be a lot better than normal. Um, I've had some 12B hunts, 12B West, that uh, have been just phenomenal. I've had some that have been really hard. But with these push back a week, I'm expecting there to be a huntable population in 12B West this year and the possibility of it being really, really good. In the last few years, because of that fire, have you seen the deer actually hold up on top and not have to pile off and, and cause a little bit of strain for those later 12b hunts you know you're seeing it a little bit um it seems like right on that 12a west 12b west boundary um there's a lot of deer held up right there um but once they make the move i think they're they're pushing through um and a lot of it has to do with just habit so you still have deer that just know hey once i start i'm going but yeah they're, they're depending on what that feed looks like in that burn you can definitely have more deer hold up on the, you know, on the late hunt than you would normally. Um, but you also might have deer showing up in the 12B every day, which which we always do. Every single day of the early hunt or late hunt, you have a new deer in there. Every single day. So you never know what's coming through. In your opinion this year, where will the biggest deer come? Off the Kaibab or off the Strip? Hmm. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I think it's going to come off the strip. I think there's going to be one that blows up. Um, I know the Kaibab has a couple absolute giants. Uh, will they get killed? I don't know. It's a lot tougher country to hunt. Um, 
Yeah, I think the syrup will produce a bigger deer. I, I, I you know, I, I don't doubt that there's going to be a two fifty plus buck this year killed in the state. You're talking. Yeah. Um, talk about the Kaibab archery hunt uh, versus the Ki- or the strip archery hunt and the differences for those people that don't really know the difference. Yeah, so the so the archery Kaibab, I'm not a huge fan of. I mean, I. I've hunted it with some guys. I personally don't apply for it. I, I, it, it's just a tough hunt for me that, you know, everybody's going to glass those burns. Other than that, you see a lot of road hunters. Um, you got to know the Kaibab to be able to get into some of those bigger bucks. Spotlighting is, is kind of crucial. Um, you can get into travel patterns and stuff up in that high stuff. If you can identify where, you know, a group of big bucks is hanging out or a big buck is hanging out and try to put yourself in position, there's, there's limited glassing other than the burns. Um, and, and I guess that's, that's why I don't like it that much for myself. Um, I know some, you know, there's some great bucks getting killed. Um, salt licks have been a, a huge thing on the Kaibab, you know, but without being able to legally run a camera on a salt lick, you know, it's, it's tough to sit all Salt Lake that you don't know what's coming in. Um, the strip, on the other hand, it's it's a glassable unit. You know, not, not all of it. You know, 13A, 13B, both of it. I mean, it, you know, there's spots that you're just not going to be able to glass. There's spots that you can glass. But at least there's high spots. You know, in August, it's hot. I mean, it's 100, 105, 110 degrees sometimes on the strip during that archery on it. Well, the Kaibab, you're sitting at the best camping weather in the state that time of year. Yeah, 8,000 um, feet, beautiful. Exactly. Yeah, so, you, you know, there's two different mentalities. You've got to be mentally, mentally tough for the archery strip on. It is brutal. Um, it is hot. The bugs, the rattlesnakes, the dust, um, just everything about the strip on, on the archery August is is horrendous. It's It's... It's the worst place on earth, but the best place on earth that time of year. <laughs> um, it's, and I, I, lo- I love the archery strip hunt. You know, I wish I could draw it more often. You know, I drew it in 2020 with some luck, and, and I, I just, I love it. I loved it last year, um, watching the storms roll in. I mean, it, it's just a beautiful place. But you can glass it. You're, you're generally by yourself with what you're hunting. Um you you just you find a buck to hunt more than likely, especially now without cameras, you can hunt it the entire hunt by yourself as long as you don't blow it out of the country. The Kaibab, you know, people overlap you, no doubt about it. You know, people drive by, people, you know, just a lot of road hunting type stuff going on. Yep. So, uh, any other deer units out there? You know, maybe south of the Grand Canyon that. Um, you know, you're kind of eyeballing for that, you know, 175, 180 type buck. Anything else jumping out at you? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, they put some December hunts out there that are, you know, super tough to draw. I think they're probably like drawing a late Kaibab tag, but, you know, 5B North or 5B and, and uh, 10 put one out this year. Um, great hunts. Uh, my daughter had a, a youth tag in 10 last year. She killed a 189 inch deer. Um, was that, that was on December hunt? No, that was uh, September. Okay. I think, yeah, I think September 28th. We killed another buck in camp. Um, one of my guides and his daughter killed a, I think it was a 193. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's, you can kill a 170 inch plus buck, I think, in about any unit in the state. It's just a matter of scouting, you know. Guys just want to show up and say, you know, find a 180 plus buck or 170 plus buck and, you know, you got to put that time in. You got to scout it. You know, it's like a lot of the stuff you talk about with those coos deer. You know, once once they rub that velvet off, you got to get get in that shade. You got to get glassy. You got to pick them apart, and they're not going to move a whole lot. Um, so th- that's really our strategy on that stuff. I mean, it's there's plenty of plenty of units. Five B's always produce some giants. Ten, uh, six A will even produce some giants. Um, seven produces giants. Uh, I, I just, I think a guy just needs to pick a unit he's comfortable with and, and, and the ultimate decision, you know, and that's what I'm going through right now with, with four points in my pocket, you know, I don't have much to draw anything. Um, you know, how, how long does a guy want to wait and how much time does he have to put in? You know, if you're going to dedicate yourself to the strip, if you don't hire an outfitter, 
it takes a lot of time to get up there and scout. A lot of time. Um, you're going to put, you know, even the archery hunt. I mean, you're going to put a lot of time in up there in order to, you know, find a buck you're, you're wanting to hunt. Um, the kaibab's a little different. You know, the kaibab, you don't have to put as much time in because it's a migratory unit. So if you have a late tag, there's no sense in showing up until the week before to see what moved into the unit. Um, all of these other units that are non-migratory south of the Grand Canyon, you've got to start scouting. You've got to spend every every bit of time out there if you want to find a, be- a great buck in those units because they don't come easy. Jason, I want to take just a second to thank the sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com and remind you guys to go to shop.gohunt.com. They're having their big Memorial Day, Day sale right now. A lot of items, 50% off. Um, you also, if you sign up for the Go Hunt Explorer Maps, um, you're going to get a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card back. So that's in essence getting the Explorer Maps for free. Um, spend $50, get $50 back. Um, the Explorer Maps are great. I've been using them on a lot of my hunts and my summer um, hiking adventures and such. Also, want to thank Kuyu.com. Um, best ultralight hunting gear out on the market lathrop and sons boots um, if you need to have your feet mapped and get uh, custom insoles uh, the custom synergy footbeds are incredible Um, they have three different uh, boot lines there they have um, the elite the mountain hunter and the encompass i've been wearing the encompass a lot on these gould's turkey mule deer and coos deer hunts i wear the mountain hunter on the sheep hunts uh, go to lathropandsons.com and you can get your uh, feet mapped and get your custom boots. Um, also, phonescope.com. Use the JScott23 promo code and uh, you're going to get a 10% discount. Um, Jason, what plans do you have, if any, for elk this season, this fall, or since it's such a great year, are you going to be devoting most of your time for scouting for your clients for um, deer? Yeah, so I'm not doing any elk hunts, any antelope hunts. I might run out with a friend or two. That's it. Um, I'll say that, yeah, it's going to be concentrating on deer. I'll spend some time you know, trying to find some bucks out there Grand Canyon that I might want to kill with a bow if I don't draw a tag. Um, outside of that, it'll be spending time on the North Rim. Nice. It's uh, it's awesome to be able to look forward to, you know, June, July, and August of these scouting times with a great moisture year in the fall. For for us guys in Arizona that just thrive on the moisture, I mean, it's, it's one of these years that you want to be in the field, you want to have tags, you know, you want to have clients in the great units. Um, so it's an exciting time for sure. Last time we talked, um, you also were doing a kind of transitioning a little bit. Um, you've been in law enforcement for a long time, but uh, doing quite a bit of real estate. Um, how's that going for you? You still um, looking for deals and such? You find anything? Yeah, it's it's going great, and that's that's really the ultimate reason I slowed down a lot on the guiding business. Um, you know, the real estate end of uh, end of what I'm doing. I've, I've just loved, you know, I mean, I've always loved real estate. I'm two and a half years into it now. Um, but I've always, bu- you know, built and sold and every, every couple to three years and done, done some spec houses and, and made, made some really good money in real estate. And, and it's tough right now to find a good deal, but stuff seems to be moving. Um, I, I think we have a couple more years of it left is my opinion before we start seeing, a. uh, bargain out there so to say um it's funny i I mean i thought we would have seen it by now with the rates doubling but it just seems like such low inventory that it just seems like there's you know so low of inventory the demand is still high and stuff still moving um you know and the government too has propped up a bunch of you know the stuff through covid and all that kind of stuff but um i really thought it would soften up a lot more than it has and you know people that were selling the pants off stuff would probably argue that it has but if, from a consumer standpoint it doesn't seem like the prices have really come down that much no i agree i don't think you know it, about six months ago or eight months ago i think we saw a little bit of decline on our prices up here not much you know a couple percent but they're right back to where they are you, you know a year year and a half ago and we're also seeing you know stuff that's priced right 
I mean, we're seeing multiple offers again. I mean, we had one the other day with eight offers on it the first day on the market. So, like you said, I think it's the inventory situation and people need housing. And then we have so much money in some people's pockets that are looking to invest and get their money out of the stock market and put it into real estate. So, I don't think it's going anywhere real quick. Um, but, it, it, you know, in, in my mind, it's tough to find a deal right now with, with the way prices and interest rates are for sure. And with the guys on the sideline that are willing to jump at anything with cash in their pocket, it, it, it's it's a tough it's environment. Tough. Yeah, but if you it's find one, it's, it's it's good. If if, if you can get one, um, there's still some deals out there. So, well, yeah. Jason, it's uh, always great talking to you. I want to give you a chance to let people uh, know how they can reach out to you or follow you, what have you. So, um, if you do that, and then I'll let you go. And I appreciate your time. Yeah, you can give me a call on my cell phone. It's the best way to get a hold of me, 928-637-8378. Um, or you can send me a message on Instagram or, or uh, Facebook. But Instagram is probably the best outside of the phone number. And that's uh, Bond Trophy Outfitters? Yeah, Bond Trophy Outfitters. Right on, bud. Well, thanks for the insight. Um, again, look you forward bet. to seeing your success this fall, and uh, I'll be chatting at you, okay? Yeah, thanks for having me on. All right, buddy. God bless. Bye.